think we should get started. Thank you all for being here and those of you who've tuned in. Um, good afternoon, I'm Kim Strom. I'm the director of the UNC Office of Ethics and Policy, and I'm a professor here at the School of Social Work. Today's event is one of um, a series of educational events sponsored by the UNC Office of Ethics and Policy in celebration of Global Ethics Month, and it is brought to you with funding from the Smith P. Thiemann Distinguished Professorship here at the school. I bring regards from Dean Ramona Denby Brinson, who's under the weather and unable to join us in person. Um, we are fortunate to have the help of our super IT team here at the School of Social Work and also our building uh, managers in uh, preparing the facility and recording today's session. I also want to acknowledge George Battle, Vice Chancellor of Institutional Integrity and Risk Management and our leader in the Ethics and Policy Office and my colleagues, Brent Eisenbarth and Matthew Teal, who with our wonderful undergrad interns have been stalwart planners for um, our Global Ethics Month activities. Our office was created in 2016 in the aftermath of scandals that imperiled UNC's accreditation and um, NCAA status. Our mission in the office is to help build and support a culture of integrity at UNC. I've been on the faculty at Carolina since 1999, and my research has focused on the topics of moral distress and moral courage, particularly trying to understand the things in us and in our organizations that keep us from doing the right thing. As you can imagine, there is a lot in the conversation to come that's resonant with what I have learned in my research and what I seek to understand and teach. About a year ago, our university ombuds, Don Osborne Adams, introduced us to Mimi and Peggy's scholarship on networks of complicity. And we were immediately impressed with the relevance of their findings for our experiences in higher ed. Their work has received other accolades. Their paper with Bill Foster on networks of complicity and equity diversity and inclusion recently won one of the 22, 2022 Emerald Literati Awards for outstanding papers. So we're in very good company indeed. Um, Amy and Peggy's presentation will be followed by commentary from two longtime UNC leaders, uh, Sue Estroff and Charles Streeter. And that will be followed by a Q&A and a discussion um, that I will facilitate and we invite your comments and questions um, our colleague Brent will be uh, fostering those uh, as they come in through the chat function on the, on the program. So let me introduce you to the panel. Peggy Cunningham is a professor at the Rowe School of Business at Dalhousie University, Nova Scotia, Canada. She was the former Dean of the faculty. Her research and teaching are in the areas of ethics, corporate social responsibility and marketing strategy. She earned her PhD in marketing and ethics from Texas A&M University. Amy Drumright is a professor at the School of Advertising and Public Relations, the Moody College of Communication, and the Business Government and Society, De Business Government and Society Department at the Macomb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. She is director of the Interdisciplinary Communication and Leadership Degree, UT's only undergraduate leadership degree. Her research and teaching are in the areas of ethics, leadership, corporate and social responsibility and communications for nonprofit organizations. She earned her PhD in business administration from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Tar Hill born, Tar Hill bred. Um, Charles Streeter, speaking of, um, uh, alums. Uh, Charles Streeter is an alumnus of the university with a bachelor's of arts and a master of arts in communication studies. He holds an MBA from Pfeiffer University. As an undergraduate, he was president of the Residence Hall Association. He's been a permanent staff member at Carolina for 46 years with 12 years. What did I say? 46? Sorry. Since he was but a child. For 26 years, with 12 years as a, delegate, uh, as a delegate of the employee forum, four of which he was chair. And Sue Estroff is a professor of social medicine at UNC. She completed her doctorate at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has been at UNC since 1983. 
All right. Her research centers on policies and services for persons with severe and persistent psychiatric disorders. She's a past chair of the UNC faculty and a current member of the faculty executive committee. So I look forward to the um, presentation and I'll turn it over to our speakers. Thank you, Kim. Peggy and I are delighted to be here. I am so impressed that you have not an ethics day, not an ethics week, but an ethics month. It makes me so proud to be a Tar Heel. So, uh, so thank you for that and thank you for including us. Peggy and I are here to talk about a presentation and a paper called Secrets Behind the Gowns, Causes and Outcomes of Persistent Unethical Behavior in Universities. We're involved in a series of studies in which we have two research questions. Why does unethical behavior persist over prolonged periods of time, often as an open secret in many workplaces, and how is such behavior stopped, disrupted, or countered? So we're using a field-based grounded theory approach where we let the theories emerge from the data rather than going in with some theories in mind. We've conducted 70 in-depth interviews using broad open-ended questions. 29 of those interviews have been with people in universities. We've talked with 43 women and 27 men in various organizational roles up and down the organization chart. We've talked to people in multiple types of organizations, universities, businesses, health and wellness, journalism, nonprofit, and we've seen basically the same themes across all those contexts, and that's what I'll be talking about. We've also uh, drawn on secondary data, some uh, investigator investigatory re reports of investigations and also legal proceedings, things like that have been helpful to us. We've, taught, we've, we've looked at many types of persistent unethical behavior, microaggressions, incivility, rudeness, mockery, disrespect, bullying, plagiarism, fraud, theft, discrimination and inequality of all sorts, sexual harassment and rape, and wrongful dismissal. And again, irrespective of the type of unethical behavior, we see the same sorts of patterns. So in universities, we're looking at many types of unethical behaviors involving various parties. We're looking at faculty as perpetrators against students, administrators to faculty or staff, faculty to faculty, faculty to staff, and staff to staff. Uh, and of course, that includes some graduate students who are employees of the university, but we basically look, have looked at employees of the university. We haven't really delved into student to student are students perpetrating unethical behavior against faculty. So two lenses have emerged from our data using this grounded theory approach. A social network theory, which explained the what, what enabled unethical behavior to persist over time, and then also behavioral ethics research, which explained the why, why people behaved in ways that enabled this unethical behavior to persist. So this is an overview of our findings. The reason unethical behavior persists is because of the network of complicity and the network of complacency. And we'll be spending most of our time talking about these two networks. But we also found other networks that emerged. These are the networks that evidence a moral courage when they get into moral distress. The whisper network where people uh, see the unethical behavior for what it is, they whisper about it and try to protect certain parties, but they don't mobilize to resist it in an organized network fashion. The transactional network, where a leader emerges and uh, networks effectively and the group together resists the unethical behavior using their moral courage. Uh, they typically want to bring about some sort of transaction like file a complaint, get rid of a perpetrator. Often they don't succeed in transforming the toxic organizational culture. In order for that to happen, it often takes a transformational network. And these are people who uh, network effectively inside and outside their organization to try to not only get rid of perpetrators, but to change the culture of organizations and of society. We won't really be focusing on those, but we will be happy to answer any questions about them. So you might be thinking, uh, what causes these these uh, networks to emerge. And a uh, big part of the explanation is organizational failure in addressing unethical behavior. 
And that sort of failure involves weak or unenforced organizational policies. It involves leaders who default on their responsibilities in leading or even join the network of complicity. Human resources often is perceived as a distrusted permanent bystander or even a complicit party that's trying to protect the reputation of the university or the, the organization. Uh, there often are problematic internal investigations conducted by insiders with conflicts of interest. And the result is often suppressing and silencing complaints and guarding the institutional rec uh, or organizational reputation at all costs. So let me explain about these, these networks, these particularly the networks of complicity. So these are networks of people who surround the perpetrator and actively protect the perpetrator from sanction and enable the perpetrator to continue the bad behavior. And you might think, how can this happen? Well, perpetrators are excellent network builders. They are power brokers and they are effective at building networks inside and outside their organizations. And so uh, these networks develop as fairly tightly connected groups of people with strong ties and few structural holes and high trust. And so then the perpetrators are able to build myths often about themselves and their indispensability to the organization. Even if they're incompetent, they somehow manage to build these myths and manipulate information in ways that, that are favorable to them. And they're able to get the network members to perpetuate this sort of um, information and the, these sorts of myths and uh, bad behavior is contagious. And many of the network members start mimicking the perpetrator and a toxic culture em emerges in the organization and it causes profound damage as it metastasizes through the organization profound damage to individuals, certainly people who are affected, but even people who only observe or hear about or are really uh, experience the effects of the toxic culture. So you might be thinking, why would anybody be a part of anything like this when it causes such damage? Well, behavioral ethics helps us understand why. When I talk about behavioral ethics, I'm referring to the cognitive biases or rationalizations that are so effective and and tricking ourselves and others. I'm talking about social and organizational pressures and situational factors. So let me give you some examples of the kinds of things that we heard from members of the network of complicity or from people who were observing them. Uh, so one reason why people participate in the network is the self-serving bias. They get the benefits, they get the perks, they get the, the good stuff that comes from being a part of the network and being affiliated with the perpetrator. The perpetrator typically has both formal and informal power, the ability to, award, to reward and, and to punish. And of course, there's all kinds of research that shows that we're inclined to obey authorities and certainly perpetrators or authorities, especially within their networks. Uh, the network creates an in-group, out-group bias. The perpetrator and the network members are parts of the in-group. And we all know how difficult it is to think poorly of the people that we interact with closely, that are our close colleagues, because it hurts our own self-image. So the in-group, out-group bias works in favor of the network. The conformity bias, everybody else is cooperating with the, with the perpetrator. How could there be something wrong if everybody's doing it? And then there's a lack of transparency. Uh, what they're doing often is, is not in clear view. And so the result is motivated blindness. Members of the network of complicity are just blind to the ethical issues because it's in their best interest to be blind. But that's not all that's going on. There's the network of complacency. And these are the bystanders who are unwilling to resist and they passively enable the bad behavior. As one person said, in retrospect, I now see that I unwittingly, unwillingly facilitated the bad behavior because of my passivity. So this is a loosely connected network with weak ties and many structural holes, which means there's low trust and restricted access to information. Not everybody sees the full picture. Some people join because they benefit, maybe in less direct ways than the network of complicity, but they benefit because the organization benefits when the perpetrator and the network succeed. Others are complacent because they're threatened or intimidated by the perpetrator. But the, the bottom line is no leader emerges to 
express moral courage and to resist the bad behavior, to, to, to network and resist. So again, we ask, you know, why? And behavioral ethics helps us understand. So there's the conformity bias once again. Nobody else is resisting. Why should I resist? Why should I stick my neck, neck out? And then there's the framing bias. We found that so many of our informants framed getting involved as a negative thing. I'm sticking my nose in someplace it doesn't belong. I'm gossiping. I'm being a busybody. I'm just going to stand clear. And then there are appeals to higher loyalty, like loyalty to the company that kind of trumps all other kinds of concerns. I just wouldn't want to drag my organization into the mud. And then also we heard some people say, you know, I firmly believe in innocent until guilty, till proven guilty. And so they use that as a reason to not get more information, to not get involved. I, again, the self-serving bias, as I mentioned earlier, why should I stack my neck out? It could hurt my career. I could turn somebody off. And then time pressure. People have, have big jobs, they're busy. And many people do not frame a part of their job as dealing with workplace ethics. That's something else. The job is actually getting the tasks done. So the result is we have a number of people with moral muteness, they're not talking about ethical issues. They have moral myopia. The moral issues are not coming clearly into focus and you can see how moral muteness and moral myopia reinforce each other. And so then we have moral disengagement. And we've got these uh, complacent folks who are complacent, even though there's great damage going on to individuals and to the organization. Now we're going to turn and draw directly from our data related to universities, and Peggy's going to come up and elaborate on those themes. Thank you, Mimi. And I just want to thank our hosts again for hosting us so beautifully and making us so welcome here. It's been a real treat. And Mimi and I are doing a series of studies. So this is um, what we're going to talk about in terms of university data is one a part of that series. But we did start with that very broad question. Why was there persistent unethical behavior in any type of organization? We looked across a number of organizations, whether they were newsrooms or healthcare systems, et cetera. And as we did a series of interviews, we also came to conclude that universities were contexts that were particularly conducive to persistent unethical behavior. So our most recent project is we have been focusing on collecting data from universities, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. Now, first and foremost is what is one of the characteristics that really distinguishes universities from some of the other types of organizations we looked on, looked at? And we found that resource dependency was a really big driver of this kind of behavior. So every university, whether you're a top tier university or whether you're a run of the mill university, that extreme focus on the importance of research, who brings in the grants, who gets the highest number of citations is so important to our definition of who we are as a university and what we do. Well, what happens when one of those research stars is a perpetrator of persistent unethical behavior? Do we sanction them? Do we punish them? Do we remove them? Do we take their power and authority away? No, we let them continue because we're so dependent on that resource. Similarly, you know, and now I'm a Canadian, so if I say A, you'll know it comes by me naturally, although I was educated in Texas and have been working with Mimi for 20 some years. So we don't put quite such an emphasis on sports in Canada, but it's still really important to our universities. You know, the fan culture, who cares about the football team? Who cares about the basketball team? Who cares about the women's gymnastic team? And again, what if the star coach abuses athletes? What if the star coach defrauds in terms of the expenses that they have? Uh, if anybody reads Canadian news, we're having a huge scandal in Canada right now about the Canadian Hockey League, who has been found to sexually abuse men and women over a period of 20 some years. And were they sanctioned? No. In fact, the Canadian Hockey League used members' fees to fight the court battles to protect these perpetrators. And then thirdly, donors. You know, as universities are more and more dependent on donors instead of government funding, and that happens in Canada as much as it does in the United States, we really seek out donors. Do we question their background? Do we look at where the money came from? At my former university, not the one that I'm currently at, we had a huge donation that built a whole hallway of offices and extension to the business school. That donor was found in court 
to have gotten his money through fraudulent means. Eventually, the university had to refund that money. We couldn't take down the bricks and mortar. But did we sanction that donor? And it took two years to take his name off the building. So those kinds of resource dependencies create part of this context that really allows persistent unethical behavior to thrive. Secondly, there are structure and organizational factors that are really unique, some unique to universities, some unique to some of the other organizations that we looked at. So certainly hierarchies and power differentials. Now, many organizations, business organizations, I was a business practitioner before I was an academic, they have hierarchies, certainly. But universities, strangely, seem to have hierarchies within hierarchies. You have hierarchies at the university as a whole, you have hierarchies in your schools, you have hierarchies in your departments, you have hierarchies according to research output. So those hierarchies and power differentials are more extreme in universities than in some other types of organizations. Secondly, even though we have these hierarchies, we still have highly siloed and autonomous units. So as a dean of a business school, I certainly had a certain amount of leeway in what I did within my school. And it was quite invisible to other people, to administrators, to regulators, to the HR department, to the legal department, et cetera. You're kind of cloistered within your own little space in the university. So think about how many colleges and schools and departments that you have that really do have that separate ability to operate autonomously. And even when it comes to administration, think about how separate and autonomous HR is from the legal department often. Sometimes they're more embedded, but it depends on your university. Now, your Title IX office may be really separated from HR. Your ombudsperson may be separated from all of those. Your counselor general may be in a third office. But that separation instead of coming together to solve problems. Then in some of the senior people that we talked to at university, we said, well, why don't you take action? And they said, well, not only is there a lot of complexity, but there are so many formal barriers to just doing anything. So certainly in both Canada and the United States, we have a tenure system. So as I said, you know, you pretty much have to kill a student before you're removed from tenure at my university. I mean, it's that, and that, I say that mockingly and I, and I shouldn't because certainly that would be a very serious crime, but it is almost impossible to get rid of somebody that is a perpetrator and has tenure. You can maybe take some of their power away, but removing them from your institution is extremely difficult to do. Now, Canada, probably more than the United States, we are in a very unionized environment. And again, my firsthand experience as a dean, as well as what some of our informants told us, the union fights every accusation, whether founded or unfounded, on the part of a faculty member. And so, as I told my colleague, and I will share with you, I had a faculty member that forged their passport. Okay, that is a federal crime. As a dean, if I don't report that crime, I am culpable. And immediately, as soon as we started to investigate that, the union got involved and came in and yelled at me by what a horrible dean I was because I hadn't protected that faculty member because actually somebody had stolen and forged his passport. Well, it wasn't true. He had forged his own passport. And it wasn't until he took a series of unethical actions, including plagiarizing his tenure document, that we actually got to re to partially remove him, but the union continued to fight for him. So when I say these are barriers, they're certainly very much there. But then it's those complex processes that we put in place to really file these complaints and have the complaints acted on. And you may have to go through four steps, six steps, sometimes even 10 steps to get the issue recognized. And a lot of people who are already traumatized as victims, particularly if you're a single victim, you know, think of if you're a single victim, trying to work against a powerful network of complicity, how disempowered you are compared to that network. So having to deal with those complex processes is really difficult. Next, think about how non-traditional our workplaces are. You know, so many of us work in private, behind closed office doors with our graduate students. You know, if there's blinds on the windows, the doors are closed because of course we want the silence so we can discuss things, but what if we want the silence because we're going to abuse that student? Hey, our students work in labs, again, free from the scrutiny of other places on campus. Many of our researchers go and do field work. I live right on the ocean, so of course we're always out in ship. Many of our researchers are out on ships or out on small boats looking at sea life, et cetera. Again, great context for which unethical behavior can take place. And then certainly, as I can say, probably better than some people, having been a dean, I had absolutely no management training when I took on that office. So I thought I was a good researcher. I think I was a good academic. I thought I was a good citizen. 
but did I have training to handle these persistent unethical behaviors? Even though I teach ethics and I work in ethics, I did not. Did I have good management training to encourage people to come forward? I did not. So not having that training really complicates this issue well. And then finally, many universities have a bicameral system. We split authority into two pockets. So our Senate hands all of the academic affairs of the university and the Board of Governors handles all the financial and administrative affairs. And particularly having sat on a Board of Governors and on a Senate, I know Senate does not understand the work of Boards of Governors, nor vice versa. Boards have very poor appreciation of the academic mission of faculties and for very little respect. So that again are some of the reasons that are unique to universities. We also have socialized beliefs and attitudes. So think about you know, the philosophy of academic freedom. Now, what a noble philosophy that you know, universities and professors have academic freedom so we can challenge society, that we have the safe position that we can take on the politicians, that we can name and call out societal wrongs. But sadly, that mission of academic freedom has often been distorted. You can't tell me what to research. You can't tell me how to teach. You certainly can't tell me how to act. And so as a result of distorting that really important socialized belief and attitudes, there's a lot of persistent unethical behavior. Now we have an independent contractor mentality. You know, I always said as a dean, it was like herding rabbit cats, not just cats, sorry, Kim. <laughs> but you know, we don't have a common set of values. Rarely as faculty do we work for the common good. Instead, we are rewarded for our individual accomplishments, often our research accomplishments. We compete with our other faculty for recognition. So not having that common sense of what can we do together to improve this organization really, again, makes universities very unique. Then we have the pay your dues mentality, particularly for people, you know, if somebody really made your life difficult as a graduate student, as you did your master's or as you did your PhD, you know, and they wanted you, they were really tough on you because they wanted you to toughen up and they wanted you to be the best. But, oh my goodness, that was hard to go through. But then instead of being kinder sometimes as a, dean, as, a, as a colleague or as a mentor, we think that person should go through the same steps and difficult steps that we went through in order to earn their stripes, so to speak. My husband's in the military, and of course, that's sort of a military concept as well. You know, if you're a, a lowly soldier learning to qualify and try to move up, you know, that learning your stripes and being really treated quite badly and bullied in many ways comes to the fore. And then finally, you know, there is massive lack of appreciation and respect for the two parts of the organization. So how many times have you heard other faculty members say about, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Dr. X or Dr. Y, oh, they went into administration because they couldn't do research. They couldn't publish. They're a failed academic, and if they wanted to keep their jobs, they had to become an administrator. And then vice versa, when you get into administration, you think, oh, those faculty, they're so troublesome. They take up so much space. They take up so much of my time. I can't manage them. I can't get them to cooperate. And we get this crushing of heads together. So again, very socialized beliefs that are very unique to universities. So what I wanna finish with was, well, it's fine to raise all of these issues. It's fine to say that networks of complicity and networks of complacency causes persistent unethical behavior. But what do we do about it? But remember, there are networks of empowerment that try from you know, putting together line employees with a leader that emerged. They are trying to solve the problem in the face of network of organizational failure. So the first thing as a leader that we have to do is stop believing that removing the perpetrator is enough. You know, we often think we get rid of that bad apple, we've solved the problem. Well, we've already talked about how difficult that is, but it isn't just the bad apple. It's the power of the network. And those networks are extremely powerful. You know, they may have political connections. If you're a perpetrator that's in the middle of the organization, they'll often have very tight ties to senior people in the organization. They may have very tight ties to donors that are coming in. They may have very tight ties to the sports. They may have very tight ties to, you know, important people in your community. So understanding how powerful those networks are is a first and starting point. And understanding that the people in the university or the people in that unit, because networks and perpetrators do control information. There's no structural holes in those networks and they can really kind of create their own myth of their value. 
create their own myth of how tough somebody is against them or how bad that victim is. I mean, oh, they weren't worthy or that victim deserved to be bullied or that victim deserved to be treated in this way or that way. They distort the information. And when victims come up and try to complain, they're facing this wall of power. And so again, we have to help those victims and help those networks. The other thing is when the perpetrator goes away, the network does not. No, the network is often made up of people who are promoted into senior roles despite having limited capabilities. They're often people who would not have gotten ahead unless the perpetrator supported them. So they want to keep those positions. They do not want to lead the authority. And we've seen universities where people in the network of complicity, even after the perpetrator was removed, have continued to rise up into senior and more senior positions. So you have to disenfranchise the network itself, not just get rid of the perpetrator. So it's often very difficult to fire those people, remove them from their departments, et cetera, but we can take away their authority and their power. And we also have to then think about how do we allocate our resources to who might next be an unethical perpetrator? Who might next get involved in one of these networks and give them, that may tempted to get involved in one of those networks and give them the resources and the training to help prevent that? And then finally, we really need as leaders to actively support those networks of empowerment. We saw a number of instances at universities where senior administrators saw a network of empowerment forming, a transactional network that wanted to go through the steps of filing a formal complaint against a perpetrator. And instead of supporting the network, administrators actively worked to separate and break down the network. Well, for privacy or confidentiality reasons, we can't let you testify together. We have to have you come separately. Well, so-and-so said this from your network and so-and-so said that from your network, pitting one network member against another network member. So instead of actively supporting and maintaining that network and helping to have its voice addressed, we, have to, we actually try to break apart those networks. And that certainly is not something we should be doing as a leader. And then finally, we've got to simplify this reporting process. So some universities are starting to use one-stop processes where you bring all of these complex processes under the authority of one department or one senior official. And that's very helpful to people trying to lodge a complaint. The other thing, and as a number of our informants said to us, it's a very strange system when you have HR or legal investigating these things when they may know the supposed perpetrators well. They may have relationships with the perpetrators. They may view the perpetrator in very different light. They may be a good buddy. They may be a good friend. They may have raised uh, money for the university, et cetera. So trying to investigate your colleagues is very problematic for any organization or any department. So again, hiring just as many businesses do and many boards within businesses do, hiring independent investigators to take the investigation forward that don't have those personal ties to potential perpetrators when they do the investigation. And then the important next step is if there is findings that what was reported is actually happening first, the perpetrator is doing this and the network is supporting that perpetrator and promoting the unethical behavior, then we have to take action. But what's really important is often trying to take what we call a beachhead strategy. Hey, remember I said my husband was in the military, so a military term, but finding a battle that you're pretty sure you can win, not trying to solve the whole university problem in one big gulp and in one big step, but taking a piece, a piece that if you are successful will be visible and show that you've taken action and you're doing something to correct the action. But if it fails, it's not going to be a big issue and you can try again. So picking that small beachhead very carefully and then acting on it. And then instilling transparency instead of putting this behind the veil because all of these investigations for confidential and privacy reasons tend to be covered up, but more importantly, again, to maintain the reputation of the organization. So there comes communication. So communicating continuously and reinforcing ethical values is really important. Providing training, but again, training that we have seen tested and that does work because some training can have the opposite effect. So again, if we look at the national collaboratories that the uh, academies of engineering and sciences are using, it's often very helpful to see some tactics there. We have to empower and transform the HR function. So as one of our subjects so clearly said, they are a joke. They don't investigate what I've reported. They have not supported me. They have only looked and tried to support the perpetrator and what the perpetrator has blamed me for doing, even though it was proven false. And they never have done anything to support me except ask me to sign an NDA. 
So we have to re-enfranchise and empower HR. And in universities in particular, HR may not be a very central function. It may not, in fairness to them, may not have the authority or the resources to take the action they might like to take. But certainly they are not trusted. They are seen as somebody that works against people that are um, experiencing ethical difficulties. So again, we really want to turn them from that permanent bystander into a proponent of ethical. I'm going to conclude with just two other points. And what was really interesting to us is that in our data, we saw with regard to universities, three distinct paradoxes. And isn't it interesting that when it comes to doing research, the uh, preeminence of research, you know, we have ethics review boards. We scrutinize every proposal for research in fine tooth detail to prevent unethical infractions. And yet the paradox, when it comes to managing any other aspect of work, we let ethical, persistent unethical transactions occur and reoccur again and again. The second paradox that we found was, and we certainly, there were still wrestling with this in our ongoing research, that people often have intertwined conflicting motivations. So on one hand, for example, we want to mentor students, particularly graduate students train them, help them be better researchers, help them be better teachers, whatever your focus might happen to be. But on the other hand, we think it's perfectly all right to abuse them at the same time. So mentoring, bullying them, mentoring, mentoring them, sexually harassing them. And in several of the most extreme cases we saw, we saw supervisors that actually stole the research of the graduate students. And so it's okay, well, I contributed to that, so it's mine and not even informing the graduate student that they'd done that. So another distinct paradox. And then finally, the last paradox is the longer that the university prioritizes reputation over ethical considerations, the longer they put it behind the veil, the more crisis they will face when it comes out. And it does come out because people do know. They know what takes place. And the scandal is often that much more difficult for the university to handle because it's clear what it's documented by the press or other people who speak out that this has been hidden for a very long period of time. So the reverse, instead of protecting the reputation, we really do undermine the reputation and the brand of the university. So it harms our university significantly in the long term. So in closing, this is a question we'd like to ask all of you. Our universities today recognize still as the creators of knowledge and the drivers of societal good, or have they abdicated some of these roles and become harborers of persistent unethical behavior? Thank you very much, and we welcome your questions. Respondent. Do I have control over this? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I do think you need to speak into the mic so that it goes out to the audience. Um, but um, Sue, Charles, who would like to go first in um, reflections that this uh, their talk engendered? All right, that sounds better. Um, but I was saying just for those on Zoom that I, I'm, I, I grew up essentially at Carolina. Um, I came here when I was 18, went from being a student, grad student, staff member. And the thing about the Carolina way kept coming to mind when you talk about these, you know, these networks. Um, and we talked about this in one of our integrity advisors meetings and what does that mean? And I think, 
that phrase being used. You don't know exactly what it is and what it isn't, but you know when someone says something about that, that it embodies a whole lot of things. Some of it probably is not good. Um, so I was thinking about the Carolina way. Um, and then as a staff member, I, I was listening to you, your presentation and, and thinking about everything you had on that screen. And I, I, I can see all of that in Carolina. Some of that people know, some of it people don't know. Some of it has been made very public. We had an academic scandal. We also had something with our housekeeping situation. Um, and fortunately there was administrators and my predecessor um, got involved with that to help expose those things. Um, but I can see a lot of those examples that you talked about here at Carolina. And I'm really wondering, you know, what more can be done to try and change the culture here so that I don't think it will ever go away because of the size of the university, but, you know, how can an individual or group of individuals begin to build something that'll always be there to try and be a disruptor? And I think organizations like the Employee Forum was founded upon that principle for staff to try and bring forth their issues and expose some of the things that we see as, you know, people who are not faculty and having to do the administrative functions of the university. So those are my initial comments. And then I have some questions later, but that's what I have to say, just, you know, the visceral immediate response. It's too bad. Um, so um, I have a lot of notes in front of me, but what I kept thinking about was, do we have a moral commons on this campus? And if we do, what does it consist of? Um, when and why do we draw lines? Or when do we say something? And I, it's something that we think about a lot, particularly in silence. And I'm gonna revert here to some thoughts from Audrey and Rich. She says, lying is done with words and also with silence. We have a lot of silence on this campus about the things that bother us. She also says, truthfulness, honor, is not something which springs ablaze itself. It has to create it, has to be created between people. Truth arises, this is me here, from shared experience, observation, and meaning that are agreed upon, that is named and known and verified mutually, not with cognitive dis dissonance when we're getting happy talk and spin about how great things are, but at least recognizing and sharing with us what our experience is. So I think also about truth telling and transparency as an issue of respect and of honoring another's right to know the truth. So this issue of trust, I think is very much at risk in public universities. Many of the power um, arrangements that you talked about are not even on campus. They're in the state capitol. They're in board of governors. They're in boards of trustees who answer to no one on campus. We have a, a system now where all of those layers are out of, out of reach for us on the campus. And it, like Charles, I have more to say, but one thing I have to say about our shared governance and where courage is on the campus, I think we have it. But I think we're too easily distracted by, okay, let's make a committee to study that issue. Or, okay, let's pass a resolution at faculty council. That will take care of it. And I think it's incumbent on us to call things as we see them, no matter what the cost, and to not get distracted and to continue to make good trouble. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, Peggy Mimi, would you like to respond to their initial comments? Sure. Well, one thought I had is the importance of people talking together and seeing the issues clearly. These can be very difficult issues, but if we're, not, if we're not using forums like the employee forum or uh, committee meetings of our departments, those sorts of things to talk about these hard issues, then we're not gonna come to a shared understanding of them and uh, plans for acting. And I think we have to believe that we can. In Texas, we have a very complicated and difficult legislature too. <laughs> I did see us at one point in time when the uh, when Rick Perry was trying to uh, remove our president, uh, the now late Bill Powers, uh, our faculty descended upon the tower. We, uh, we mobilized, we networked, we made a difference. We got our alumni, he stayed in power. So I think we have to believe that we can do things. We have to use the forums that we have to have these conversations that are difficult to come to agreement, to network, and to come up with action plans. Because if we don't try, we're certainly not going to be able to make positive change. Well, again, thank you both for your for your comments. And I was just kind of thinking, you know, in my former role as a dean, you know, you don't, it's always really difficult to raise alone the issue. And particularly if you keep harboring at a certain issue. And some of the people that we interviewed referred this to us. I don't want to be known as a troublemaker. And we often forget when we're in senior roles that we need networks of support just as much as people lower down in the organization do. So the networks of empowerment that we saw emerging really emerged from the, the, the staff level and the faculty level. They weren't in formal administrative positions. But without a leader who could build trust, who really had authentic moral courage, who really wanted to do the right thing, who could form a network that gave them a more powerful voice against these networks of complicity, it's very difficult to take action in the face of that. But I think we forget as administrators, as those within universities who want to take action, that we need a network as well, so that we're not being that troublesome dean, we're not taking up too much space, and that we act. I think you called it your uh, the value, the commons value, the value moral, that, commons. moral commons. If you have these people that will come together and act in concert against that, I think it would might be really helpful. I, I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> Does it make a difference in the size of an organization as to, you know, the complexity and the difficulty of disrupting uh, the complicit networks or the number of them? Because we're we're big university, um, and we have so many different layers, and there are things that you find out about that have been going on for years, and no one's brought it forward. So how would one well, that was my first question. Does the size of an organization matter? Can I, can I add to that question, which is also some of the cases were sort of perpetrators as in, you know, bad actors. And so to sort of add to Charles's question, does it matter if the unethical behavior is more amorphous, is more baked into the it's it, that it's not just localized with sort of one person or one department, but more. So I don't know if that relates to yours, but I tag it on. Maybe I'll, ta I'll take a first attempt and then pass it to Mimi. But I thought it was really interesting when you talked about the Carolina way. And so that's your culture. And certainly, you know, cultures affect large organizations and cultures affect small organizations. And we know that taking changing culture it takes a long time to take a really strong culture and turn it into a toxic culture. Similarly, it takes a very long time and many steps to take a toxic culture and turn it into a more open, transparent, and ethical culture. But certainly size and complexity, you know, I'd be a fool if I didn't say that didn't matter because it does. <laughs> so one point I wanted to make in response to your question about amorphous bad behavior or, or um, bad behavior that's not isolated to a few perpetrators are, are, are clear perpetrators. I think, and we'll need to get more data, but I think we're seeing in these big organizations, some that are universities, an ability to have all the problems with just a network of complacency. So there's not people who are actively intending to do wrong, but they're just a lot of complacent people 
who are not motivated and don't have the moral courage to step forward. Um, so, so I think that I'm seeing in, in some of the data that sort of thing. And uh, yes, it is harder in a, a bigger organization, but you also have the potential for more allies in a bigger organization. And we've seen that it's hard to change the culture and hard to reverse the effects of the, of the bad behavior in small and large organizations. So I think that the flip side is you've got other potential, you've got more potential allies. I have a question too. Um, so it seems to me that one of the things that stops us is risk assessment. And there are different risk assessments across all of us on campus. But the bottom line seems to be what's worth taking the risk. And it's really important, particularly in terms of leadership, when a person wants to keep their position so much that they don't either do the right thing or take the risks on behalf of the rest of us. So some of us may be willing to take risks that others aren't, but unless we do, nothing is gonna change. It, it's not, it's a calculation that the, the nature and meaning of the university and what it stands for is more important than something that's relatively trivial. And I was gonna say to you, I thought your um, research analogy was very interesting, but in research, you have to get informed consent. I don't think a lot of our consent is informed. And a lot of the time we're not consenting and it doesn't seem to matter. You mean as employees or members yeah. of the community? Yeah. yeah, right. Can I'll just can I add a couple of points and to what the speakers might say to your piece? In my research, Sue, one of the things that I see is the um, the the role of futility of people's feeling of I'm not going to say anything because it's wired or because. People have tried to bring this up before and nothing's happened. So that being one of the pieces. Another is optimism of, well, I want to be part of, you know, I can make more change from within than by being carved out of the herd. So I'll try to show up at the cocktail party and make nice to the crusty or whatever. Um, and then I think the, the third thing is just the discomfort of, um, you know, being the skunk at the garden party of, you know, the meeting's about to wrap up. And then somebody said, well, what about, you know, I mean, and so I think, and I think there also, which might be a question for you and Charles later is the ways that our organizations that could be quite empowered, like faculty council and employee forum, the ways that, that the maybe subtle ways of sort of neutering those or muting those or marginalizing or co-opting. I don't know what goes on, y'all may know, but that, that's, anyway, I wanted to throw in my pieces for my research in, in addition to your answers. So I don't think you can be an ethical, effective leader and be risk averse, that those are just very contradictory mm -hmm. ideas. You've got to be willing to, uh, to take risks and you've got to be other oriented. You can't be oriented toward your own degree or your, your, your own job. You've got to be oriented toward the common good, toward the, uh, mission of the organization. And, um, and I just think that if you don't think that you can make a difference, then uh, there's all kinds of research, Mary Gentile's, our research, others that show you're not going to get to a point of moral courage. You know, you've got to believe you can make a difference, um, even if it's going to be long term, even if it's going to be hard fought, you've got to believe that or you're probably going to just um, shrink into the background, and that doesn't do anybody any good. So without, without courage, I don't think you can, can be a leader in these days. I just want to say that we are fortunate on this campus to have one, and she's sitting over there, um, who speaks truth to power wisely sometimes, but it's it's really makes a difference. 
Um, Mimi Chapman, who is the chair of our faculty. And this is her building. So, so what do you do when the leader of an organization is then put in a position where trying to be ethical jeopardizes the organization and the organization is put at risk and it's not directly to the leader? Because um, there have been situations that I know of where it's like, yeah, you can speak out, but then your organization is going to pay the cost. And then what do you do in that situation? No, I think maybe something that I could add is, you know, sometimes we, you know, we all, you know, we say cost benefit analysis is not the way to go. And yet we all do cost benefit analysis. And to say that, you know, there isn't risk, well, there is absolutely risk. And there's risk to our position, there's risk to being like some of our informants were very, you know, once they spoke out, they were very isolated from their colleagues, people didn't want to be associated with them because they were being blamed for raising this horrible issue and making it more transparent, etc. But I think when we do cost benefit analysis, we do tend to downplay the harm to the organization that this unethical, persistent unethical behavior causes. And I think the thing, I mean, in doing this research, I think the thing that surprised Mimi and I the most, because we've worked together for many, many years, is we certainly had to be very ethical in how we approached our subjects and how heart-wrenching some of their stories were of being victimized, et cetera. But we didn't expect the emotional toll that we experienced as researchers and seeing what people went through and particularly those networks of empowerment if they really believed that they could act, they created, a, you know, often they were started by a leader who had a sense of safety. They were at a certain level of their position and they weren't going to go up or they weren't going to go down. They could have been a faculty member who had tenure. So you weren't going to be able to remove me from my job, et cetera. But they went in often very naively. If we get rid of the perpetrator, everything's going to be solved. And then senior administration didn't support them. And the devastation of that was incredible. So often then, and especially if, if this network was pervasive and it involved some of your top academic personnel, they left. Those who can find other jobs will find other jobs. Those who care about ethical organizations will go to ethical organizations. So there was huge loss of people. The people that remained who couldn't maybe move because they had a, a partner that was already working in the same town and had a job there, or, you know, whatever kept them in place, they became totally demotivated and demoralized. So I don't care about my work. I'm not motivated to do a good job anymore. I don't believe in the system. And so that again was extremely detrimental. And then when the scandal breaks, and it does, you talked about it here in your opening remarks about you know, losing the danger of losing your accreditation. And in some of the cases that we saw, enrollment went down, donors withdrew their funding, because they then uncover or know from reading it in the newspaper, you know, you really face a crisis that you knew about this for a long time and you did nothing. And so that risk is much greater than the risk of not doing anything as you go forward. We've uh, found that it takes a network to defeat a network. And so even when it seems like the uh, legislature or the powers that be are far too, too big and powerful to, uh, to confront, I think that with the appropriate networking, when you think of the uh, faculty, the alumni, the others, with the appropriate networking and the appropriate motivation, things can be done even when it seems impossible. And the other thing I would say is I think that good leaders need to encourage dissent. And if we're not encouraging dissent, then we're missing a lot of the things that we can learn, a lot of the ways we can improve, a lot of the ways that we can serve the public good. We do have um, an organized group. It's called the Coalition for Carolina. It includes former chancellors, leaders on the campus now, alumni who are absolutely in this broader network, um, calling it as they see it, um, countering the kind of toxic positivity that really metastasizes the campus. Charles. Comment, question? I was going to ask. So you mentioned um, metastasizing in one of your slides. 
And so that's like a cancer. And sometimes you um, don't know it's a cancer. So how do you find those symptoms in order to get that diagnosis that this thing is in existence, that we have these networks operating? I mean, of course, we know that there, there are some, but you know, if you don't know, how do you uncover that? I mean, it's going to sound very simple. It's going to sound very simple. And I mean, it's tough. You know, I don't want to make it seem, oh, it's Cecile, you just do X, Y, and Z. But what we often saw in the people that we interviewed and in our own experience is often you fail to listen. You just don't want to listen to those voices that are, that are raising that dissent or saying this is here or say, and again, because these networks control information and shape information and shape their own positions and shape their contribution, et cetera, I mean, you have to be a very attuned listener and look for those signs that there is a network forming or look at things like, you know, in some of the other organizations that they look for. I mean, boards of directors, for example, are very attuned to what's happened to your churn rate in your organization. So your churn rate is in, you know, all of a sudden in the last two years, have a number of your employees started to leave or you had no record of employees leaving. You had a good retention plan and people stayed in the organization, but then something changes. Well, what has caused that change? So looking for those points of change, looking for other indicators that something has changed and is not going right, just as we do. Well, I'm not a medical person, but I'm stepping on Sue's toes a little bit here. But looking to see, you know, what are those symptoms that are not right in your face before they do metastasize and become those very large crises that we're all facing? But it's being attuned to those small indicators. To elaborate on... On Peggy's first point, we had uh, one informant who started uh, making a, a pronounced effort to have encounters with people who were not his direct reports, to listen to them, to have town hall meetings, to solicit opinions from them. So he wasn't just listening to his um, echo chamber. His echo chamber, right. The One of the terms that your comments make me think about is um, from the book, The Conscience Code. Uh, they talk about ethics refugees and basically the people, and part of the discussion in the book is that graduate schools are populated with ethics ref people who left firms and or organizations because of unethical behavior and have decided to go back to school, switch careers. And so the kind of demoralization or work job withdrawal or um, the quiet quitting, those are some of the symptoms I hear you talking about. Great. Mm -hmm. Can, can someone from the bottom up, how can we teach our leaders from the bottom, those of us without manager, supervisor titles, how do we make that transition up in order to get them what they need to be ethical leaders? Yeah. Any recommendations from you all? You know, I, I think that is a hard issue, but not an impossible issue. And I think, again, it's often through groups like the employee forum or through um, panel discussions, through um, you know, various approaches to get topics on their radar, to set the agenda in ways that will influence them. Uh, but, but you're right, it is, it is difficult when you're uh, trying to sell an issue up, but there are books written on how you sell issues up to your, to your bosses. And it has a lot to do with understanding what's making them tick, understanding their uh, priorities, and trying to frame things in terms of things that are important to them. And um, I've seen people that I call corporate, pol corporate social policy entrepreneurs who have had all the characteristics of new business entrepreneurs, but they're trying to lobby, they're pouring their energies into getting a new corporate policy, new organizational policy in place. And they uh, just work at it in a dogged way, and they're doing it because it's the right thing to do, but they are very adept politicians at framing it in ways that um, make it very acceptable to the leaders, to the organizations that are in sync with the pronounced and announced organizational goals, and then they're, they're very good communicators. So I, I think perseverance is underrated and not giving up. And I think we get it, we get distracted, we get tired, we get um, full of despair, and that's exactly what they want. And I think finding small victories 
or at least a sense of integrity with yourself, that you spoke up, that you acted up, that you didn't let it pass. These are um, little steps that hopefully add up to a big leap. The other, the other thing I would say is in the academic leadership program here at, at Carolina, our definition of leadership is someone who can rally willing followers toward a common goal. And th by that definition, it can be anybody. Mm -hmm. The other suggestion I have, or the other thought I have, is important to watch the meta communications, to watch what happens when a difficult question is posed, how the question may be dodged, or the, your point about, well, let's have a committee. Um, and um, so, and, be, and as a group being prepared for the dodge, right? Because it, there's a bit of a patterned behavior around those things, I think, that um, can be anticipated and, you know, some people can focus on the substance of the conversation, some focus on the process, but try to avoid being patronized and, you know, uh, we'll get to that in the future and then we never do, right? So. I've got a book for you and it's agenda setting. Uh, it's, it's on agenda setting. It's by John Kingdon, who was a University of Michigan political scientist. And he has a lot of really helpful ideas about how you have to look for fertile ground and you have to couple your idea with something that really matters uh, within the organization. I'm the director of a degree that took 12 years of lobbying at UT Austin to get it into uh, into reality, and now it's the it is the College of, of Communications' most competitive degree to get into, and so you know you you do have to persevere in big organizations, and it's great that we have two longtime employees here because it takes a long time mm -hmm. often to bring about change in these big organizations, and I completely agree with Sue. You you've got to be persistent. You've got to be dogged. You've got to believe, and just keep after it. The other book I was thinking about um, is uh, The Courageous Followership by Ira Chalif um, is also very much in the, uh, uh, the vein of what you're talking about, Mimi. Yeah, maybe in answer to your question, I can give you one example. And, you know, often in, you know, if we're in senior administration in universities, we forget how little we hear the voices of people around us. And again, that siloness and the autonomy that we work with under. And one of our informants described a case where um, a fairly new president, no, not a new, new president, but somebody that had been replaced a longstanding president came into the university. And one of the things that they did was renew their ethics policy. Um, and, and we know how ineffective ethics policies often are, but this person was attuned enough to want to know how campus-wide the policy was being accepted and how people felt about it and was it making a difference. So the president sent out a message inviting anybody to comment on what their experience was at the university. And one of the people who had been a victim went and spoke to the president about how she had been shunned by HR, how she had to sign a non-disclosure agreement even to get them to file a complaint. So the non-disclosure agreement you know, prevents you from speaking to anybody about the case. So again, spreading knowledge that this has happened in the university was very difficult. And just the fact that he sat down with her, he listened, and then the next meeting that he called was with HR and invited her to attend. So again, that's the moral courage of acting in that way, but of actively reaching out to try and break down the silos and the boundaries. Because I don't know, I mean, as faculty members, how often do you speak to the president? You know, our president, our new president that we have at our university, I've never seen him in three years. So, I mean, he's just an invisible, you know, part of it's a pandemic, but part of it, he's a, just a very retiring person. So how do you make, reach out to everybody in the university so you, their voices can be heard, so. The, the other thing I think about is the importance of our solidarity with each other and not letting someone, the isolation that you talk about. So I think about instances where someone who's, an, who's outspoken is seen as, oh, them again, or disgruntled employee or, um, oh, they're an active, they're activist, or they've got an axe to grind, and trying to, in the moment, say, you know, that's your way of seeing this, you know, I mean, the way that someone who's persistent is seen as sort of stubborn, or, you know, that that's weaponized against people, and I would say that's probably also gender and racial 
uh, implications of how that I, those labels are used to silence people. And so how can all of us kind of be on the lookout for that to avoid that? Brent, you have a question from the field, from the... Yeah, so we... So we have a question from the audience. Thank you, Alan. So the question is, um, the framework for understanding complicity, complicis, um, complicity and complacency is very helpful. Do you have any suggestions for academics working within state laws that are oppressive, like Florida's Stop Woke Act, which restricts professors and others from teaching about racism, transphobia, heterosexism, uh, implicit bias, and other topics? even though they would be a part of a social work curriculum. Um, and similarly, um, academic freedom, how do you navigate the state sort of component of that? So one of the most grievous things to me is the notion that we don't teach our history and learn from our history because it might make someone feel uncomfortable. This is just a hugely grievous thing for me and it just, um, undermines everything we know about education. And so I think we just have to mobilize and try to resist these kinds of forces in every way we can. There's not a simple answer, but uh, if ever there was a, if ever there were a call for us to try to network and mobilize, this is it. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Who I can tell you want to say. Yeah, I uh, I, I go back to this idea of public, and my view of public is that it's not the people who are elected who get to tell us what to do and why we're doing it, but it's the people who vote. And those are two very different things. And if our estimation is that the public, and by that I mean everyone, is not well served by the kind of toxic happy talk, the silence, the what I would call propaganda, which wears us down so that sooner or later we agree that that's the way it is. And I think it, it's not going too far to say that's what we're facing right now, that there's too much cognitive dissonance if you say, oh, that's, no, that's not how it is. It's this way. Um, these are the things I think we have to confront head on. We have to name things as we see them and not let the dialogue be determined by someone else or the vocabulary or the meaning. Absolutely. And our democracy is threatened, not just our institutions of higher education, our whole democracy is threatened. So we just have to mobilize as, um, as people who want to defend our, our universities and our democracy. And I would just say the rich tradition of civil disobedience and the definition of moral courage is action on behalf of principle despite harms. And so um, it's a call to action, as you say. Charles, you were gonna say something. You want, okay. You have another question. Thank you. Yeah, another question we'll we have. take this as the last one, Brent. Well, that's perfect. This is the other question we have in the chat. So the last question we have would be, is retraining effective? Um, is there evidence showing that retraining is effective at dealing with perpetrators of moral um, of problems? <laughs> so thank you, Christine, for that question. No. <laughs> and um, I think what's really, and thank you for that question, because it's a very important one. But sadly, and why HR tends to fail so many times, and as unbelievable as this may seem, but we had a number of cases revealed in our data where actually it was victims who were requested to confront and train the perpetrator. So if the person has not only had enough harm as a result of being a victim, whether it was sexual harassment, whether it was bullying, whether it was defamation, whether it was discrimination, then HR turns around and said, he doesn't understand 
the impact that he's had. You have to be there with the counselor at these meetings and make him understand that. You have to confront the perpetrator. Yeah. Well, I, I was, when I told you that Mimi and I got quite <laughs> emotionally affected by, by these narratives as well. So that kind of retraining does it. And we saw a number of universities who tried to educate perpetrators. And particularly if it's a long-term perpetrator who's done this for years and years and years, I don't think, I haven't seen any examples of training. Now, maybe the National Academies is showing up some, but training does work for things like getting bystanders to coalesce and come more together, giving them more confidence to give voice to their values. But I don't think it works for perpetrators, personally. Last thing. For me on this, uh, the thing I say to myself is when it looks messy or I don't have time or I feel like no good is going to come of it, the question I ask myself is, if not me, who? If I'm not willing to do this, why would I expect anyone else to do it? So that's a little test I have for myself, which sometimes undoes the malaise and the frustration and the resignation. There's a quote in the John McCain book about courage. It basically talks about the harm of not speaking up, that, you know, the courage of the stairs and thinking of the right thing to say after the moment and the ways that we may castigate ourselves for not, you know, speaking up. And so the better we are at speaking up, um, you know, there's a price that you may pay for speaking up, but there's also a price we pay for silence. Ellie Wiesel said the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And I tell my students the opposite of good ethics is not bad ethics, it's indifference. And I think we all just need to uh, take to heart the um, serious lessons that we can learn from, um, from history when people don't speak up and don't try to put their values into, into, into action. And we see that when we study, you know, World War II, the Holocaust, all those. You need the microphone, Sue. Deserve this. Our future colleagues and students deserve our trying to preserve this for them and to protect it for them. Charles, closing comment? I'm going to agree with Sue. Um, I think that Despite everything, we've talked about the issues here at Carolina within the institution of the University of North Carolina, this campus in particular um, is a bastion for speaking out and trying to do what's right and to bring forth the issues um, that affect the faculty, the students, and the staff. And if we don't do what we know we should do and speak out on those things, the future of the institution of UNC, all 17 campuses, is in jeopardy. And UNC is a leader, especially in the world of public higher education. Nothing persuades people at UT to do something more than saying, well, this is what they do at Carolina. This is what they do at Michigan. So if our public Ivies like Carolina, Michigan, and Berkeley don't hold fast to values, then many, many other institutions will be affected. And I will take away from today's talk, among many things, it takes a network to defeat a network and um, go forth and build networks. So thank you so, so much. Thanks those of you who came online and also those of you who are here. And we will have this recording available on our uh, ethics and policy at UNC website in the next uh, few days. And you can also look there for uh, record in the next day or so for recordings from last week's talk with Paul Pringle about Bad City and um, the presentation on Am I My Colleague's Keeper and also about professions in ethics. So uh, check out the website for the archives. And again, thank you so much and thanks to the audience.